Yes, please. Live? Yes. So, good evening and welcome. Good evening and welcome to this session on New Age of Connected Healthcare Delivering Last Mile Access. This is a session, the day three of the RAISE Summit, the Responsible AI for Social Empowerment, which was inaugurated by Honorable Prime Minister two days back. And since then, we have had lots of speakers from across the world speaking on various aspects related to artificial intelligence. Today, we have a stellar panel, panel of speakers for this session on New Age of Connected Healthcare. Leading them, we will have a keynote address by Dr. Sunil Vadwani, who is the founder donor and of Wish Foundation and of Vadwani AI. And they run more than 300 technology-enabled health clinics in, in various parts of India. And they have contributed a lot to, a, to AI and to healthcare in, broadly in India. Dr. Amandeep Gill is the CEO and project director of IDARE. And he is the, he, he is the graduate of, uh, at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, Geneva. And he also teaches two interdisciplinary master's courses on international learning and on technology, security, politics, and norms. And he is a you know, foreign service officer of in, in Indian for IFS, but uh, specializing in technology and healthcare. Dr. Idu Bhushan is the CEO of National Health Agency, the architect of Ayushman Bharat, and the, currently leading the National Digital Health Mission Initiative in Government of India. Dr. Sangeeta Reddy is the president of uh, FIKI, as well as joint managing director of Apollo Hospital Groups, and she has been contributing immensely to expanding healthcare in the country. Mr. Chris Schutter is the Head of Digital Cloud Platforms and Innovation at NHS Business Services UK. We welcome you here for this panel. Dr. Sanjay Badi is the Head of AWS Research, uh, AWS Research and he is one of those authorities with regard to using AI and for, uh, for research and for enabling healthcare. Mr. Andrew Trister is the Deputy Director of Digital Health and Innovation and at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and is a physician, scientist, passionate about leveraging technology to improve healthcare for all. We have Dr. Shiram K. Murthy, who is the CEO and Chief Data Scientist at Quadratics. And he has done his PhD in data mining and machine learning from John Hopkins University and his master's in CSE at IIT Chennai in 1990. Dr. Rahul Panikar is the Chief Innovation Officer of Vadwani AI. And he has been a part of this panel, helping us curate this session and ensuring that we are able to address the key issues which can help uh, uh, improve healthcare by use of technology, by use of artificial intelligence. So I welcome you all to this panel discussion. Audiences have joined from across the world and without spending any more time on introductions, I will request Dr. Sunil Vadwani for his keynote address. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be over here uh, and to be speaking just before this very eminent panel that's going to be coming up in a few minutes. Uh, just. Uh, one minute of personal background to give some context uh, to uh, what I'll say. And I'm going to describe very briefly just my personal journey uh, uh, in healthcare in India and now how we're applying data and artificial intelligence to improving healthcare at the last mile. Um, I grew up in India, in Delhi and Bombay. I went to IIT Chennai. So it's wonderful to see there are some other IIT Chennai alums on the panel. Um, and then I went to the U.S., uh, to Carnegie Mellon, got my master's degree. And since then, I've stayed on in the U.S., and the U.S. has been my home. Uh, since graduation, I've started a few different companies in the healthcare space, information technology, and so on. I've taken a couple of companies public in the U.S. The largest of these companies grew to over a billion dollars in revenue, over 34,000 employees. Uh, I've also been a very active angel investor, both in the US and India, helping fund the startup of you know, early stage technology companies. Why do I mention all of this? Because through these activities, uh, you get a sense of how to apply technology to real world issues. Um, and you also develop a sense of what it takes to scale up uh, organizations and to scale up initiatives, because that's very important when you're trying to have impact uh, you know, at the last mile. So while I've been doing all of this, whether it's starting companies or working with startups, I travel to India very frequently. In India, of course, growing up, uh, whether it was when I grew up, whether it's today, you're never that far away from really deep poverty. And you realize fairly early in life what a difference it makes where you're born. If you're born into a decent family that can afford to educate you, et cetera, wonderful. You go to school, you go to college, you do well. 
If you'd been born a half a mile or a mile away in a slum or in a rural area, a low income community, life is very, very different. So, so because of that, I decided 20, 25 years ago to try and make whatever little difference I might be able to. And I started working with NGOs in the healthcare space in India. Through them, I got to travel to remote parts of India, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, and so on. And I got to see firsthand just how dysfunctional the, in the public health system is if you're living in a very low income community, whether it's in an urban setting or in a rural setting. I remember one time I was in Rajasthan and you know, everywhere I travel, I talk to families over there. And I met with a farming couple uh, in Rajasthan, a husband and wife, they were probably in their mid to late thirties, destitute conditions uh, that they were living in, very, very poor. And they told me their story. Uh, again, a farming family with a very small you know, farm. Both the husband and wife had been working. Uh, this, by the way, the story was around eight or 10 years ago. Uh, and then they said that the wife started getting certain symptoms. Uh, she started urinating frequently at night, starting getting uh, intense low back pain. So she went to the local community health worker, told her about this. Uh, the ASHA uh, worker gave her some goalies, uh, some pills to be had. Uh, the pills didn't make any difference. Then the community health worker said, you need to go to a clinic. Uh, this lady went to the clinic, but there's no physician over there. She lost a whole days of earnings going and coming. And cutting a long story short, it took several months and she wasn't able to get any help. Either there wasn't a physician at the clinic, or if they went there, the you know, proper blood tests weren't available to do anything, then she had to go to a different place. And the problem kept getting worse and worse. And the tragedy of it was that it got bad enough that she had to stop working. So here was a very poor family, two wage earners in the family. Suddenly, because of this health condition, uh, the wife was unable to work, and now their income was cut in half. It turned out afterwards that this lady had severe diabetes that could have been diagnosed very easily, very early. It's a very simple blood test. Treatment is also very simple, but because of these multiple failures in the public health system, eight, 10 years ago, she wasn't able to access this help and the family already poor was now really destitute. And I remember thinking even at that time, eight or 10 years ago, technology and innovation, just simple technology, not anything very advanced, could make such a difference. So for example, if the community health worker had a simple app on her phone, enabling her to ask a few questions of the patient, saying, you know, here's your symptom, here's a follow-up question, et cetera, that then helps her to assess how serious is the situation, does the patient need to go to a clinic, et cetera, that could have made such a difference. In the clinics, even if there was no doctor present, because in low-income communities, there's a big shortage of medical personnel. Simple e-consultation, right? Telemedicine, a doctor could have come in over a screen, spoken to the patient, given the right advice, et cetera. So I just thought how transformative, you know, innovation and technology could be in this process. Now, if we fast forward to today, we have many of these things in place. We have apps that help frontline healthcare workers do a better job. We have apps to help train them. We are using teleconsultation and so on. So I, I truly believe that today, in 2020, we're at the cusp of a really major transformation in healthcare in India. Technology and innovation has marched forward dramatically in recent years, we all know this. The second thing that I see that, that's, that's truly tremendous is a huge commitment from government at both the central government level as well as at the state government level to really make a difference to improve lives of ordinary citizens, whether it's in healthcare, education, et cetera. And for the first time that I've seen in many years, government is very open to new ideas and it's very open to working with the private sector. I think that's huge. Uh, and of course, we've seen all the moves that the government has made in recent years, right? Year 2017, uh, the government came up with a new national health policy. It was our first new health policy in almost 20 years. And there were two strategic, uh, pillars to this policy. One pillar had to do with primary healthcare, a recognition that primary healthcare is the foundation of healthcare. Uh, and the government is in the process of transforming 153,000 primary health centers and sub centers 
into what are called health and wellness centers with an expanded range of services for all of our citizens and with the use of innovation, technology, and so on in these, in these clinics. The second big strategic pillar for the government is the Ayushman Bharat, the, the uh, program being run by the National Health Authority. And it has to deal with the cost of healthcare, because as I said earlier, the cost of healthcare can be devastating for families. So this provides coverage, as we all know, for 100 million families, 500 million people. It's the largest program of its kind in the world to defray the costs of severe healthcare, secondary and tertiary healthcare. And this is being managed by the National Health Authority. And we will have the privilege in a few minutes of hearing from Dr. Indu Bhushan, the head of the National Health Authority, as to the work that's being done there. So there are, and then last year, as we know, the government came up with the National Digital Health Blueprint, which laid out a framework for the use of data throughout India's national health system. This year, uh, the National Digital Health Mission uh, uh, was announced under the uh, leadership of the National Health Authority, which is now going to be in the years ahead, laying out the data framework and making sure that we can truly build a digital health system for the future. So government is really helping to pull us forward. At the same time in the private sector, we are seeing lots of innovation, whether that's at the ground level from innovators, uh, whether it's the corporate sector stepping in, whether it's civil society playing their part, and everyone is starting to work together to make this happen. I've had the privilege of, of seeing what can happen when all these different parties work together just to, through, through two relatively small initiatives that I've been involved with. So seeing the power of what innovation and technology can do in healthcare, about six months ago, uh, sorry, six years ago, I started a program called WISH, the Vadvani Initiative for Sustainable Healthcare, based in New Delhi. Uh, and the goal is how to transform primary health systems in very low income communities using innovation and technology. So when a patient comes into a primary health clinic, how do we set up a simple electronic health record? After that, how do we have a set of simple, easy to use, smart diagnostic devices? Low cost, but that can very accurately measure what's happening with the patient. Then if there's no physician available in these low income areas, how do we provide access to physicians through teleconsultation? Then the physician diagnoses the patient, says, here's the medicine you need. How do we get this medicine to the patient quickly, easily? How do we then use data to track stock levels so that we can reorder medicines as needed? And through all of this, how do we get data so that we can manage the patient's health better and also manage population health better? So we do this in the clinics that we have. And right now, uh, Wish Foundation is running over 650 clinics in low-income areas in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Assam, UP, Delhi, and other areas. And what's interesting is this model of innovation in primary healthcare that we are propagating through Wish Foundation is getting a lot of interest. So many states now in the last couple of years have asked us to set up program management units to help them, to help these state governments incorporate innovation at a very large layer, at a large scale, through the big uh, systems that they run. Uh, with COVID, over the last six months, Wish Foundation obviously has been doing a lot in that front, helping many states set up COVID war rooms, set up large-scale teleconsultation networks, which didn't exist before, set up isolation wards in rural areas. So our team is busy, but the power of what we're doing isn't because of us. We're a very small part of it. It really comes through the partnerships that we have with government, both central government as well as the state governments, partnerships that we have with the corporate sector, with innovators and so on. So Wish Foundation is running and then about two and a half years ago, my brother, who's also an entrepreneur, also based in the US, um, we decided to team up and we said, look, artificial intelligence is this very powerful new set of technologies uh, that's becoming available worldwide. Uh, it is being used in commercial applications to sell us more stuff, et cetera but it's not really being used in a large way for social good. How do we use AI to improve healthcare for poor people in developing countries? How do we use it to improve education, so financial inclusion and so on? Uh, and there was relatively little work being done two, three years ago in these areas and no critical mass of people anywhere. So we set up two and a half years back uh, an institute in Mumbai, uh, the Vadwani Institute for Artificial Intelligence. 
And the idea is to apply data science and AI for social good in areas like healthcare, education, and so on. So we have teams at the Institute working on applying AI in areas like tuberculosis. How do we detect TB earlier? Uh, how do we treat it better? We have teams working on AI in maternal and child health. How we detect, how do we detect high-risk pregnancies earlier? How do we accurately detect low birth weight babies uh, earlier so that we can then give the right treatment? Uh, we have teams working on farming. We're all familiar with the thousands of farmer suicides that happen frequently in India, largely because farmers lose a large chunk of their crops to pests, uh, insects, bugs that come and eat up the crops. So we're applying AI in these areas. Obviously now with COVID, we're applying AI aggressively uh, to help state and local governments plan ahead. Uh, we come up with very detailed caseload forecasts for these governments looking two, three months out so that they can predict better the caseload they'll have. Based on that, how many ICU beds do they need? How many healthcare workers, ventilators, and so on and so forth. Uh, we also have a team working on the, the possibility of detecting COVID through the sound of a person's cough. Uh, if that actually works, and we'll know this in the next few weeks, that could be a game changer globally, not just in India. But these are just examples of the power of what can be done using technology and innovation, but as important by working together. Government, civic sector, corporate sector, you know, et cetera. So personally for me, I'm very, very excited. I think we're at a turning point right now in India. And I think the next decade, the next 10 years can be truly transformational. If we apply innovation, technology, artificial intelligence intelligently, and we do it at all levels and we work together, again, central, state government, private sector, et cetera, we can make dramatic things happen. The goal I think for all of us is we're sitting in the year 2020, COVID obviously is accelerating a lot of the efforts we're working on. Our goal is for all of us in the next 10 years, by the year 2030, the date of the United Nations SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, our goal must be to ensure that every citizen of India, regardless of income, has access to good quality, affordable healthcare at all levels, primary care, secondary care, tertiary care. Working together, we absolutely can make it happen. We must make it happen. We will make it happen. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Dr. Gale, I'll turn it over to you right now. Thank you very much, Sunil, for those inspiring remarks. I think you placed our discussions in the right context, the human context, why what we do matters. Uh, and you also ended on this uh, note of collaboration, the need for collaboration uh, across different levels of government, but also across different sectors, public, private, academia, uh, civil society. Thank you so much. I, I wish you stay on a little bit if you have the time sure. to listen. Sure. Uh, to, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, let's now turn to our panel. Uh, Abhishek has already introduced the fantastic panel we have today. So I'll just do a little bit of scene setting by talking about uh, uh, the theme of technology, human-centered technology, the importance of basing our efforts on digital health in local settings. As Sunil described, the use of these AI models for predicting the burden on the health system in the COVID crisis. Uh, so using local data sets to drive innovation, drive excess and better health delivery, better public policy on health. Uh, then the importance of building interoperable digital infrastructures and diagnostic flows. The power of digital technologies cannot be unleashed till we have those flows. And we've seen this with India's experiments in the financial domain, how Aadhaar led to uh, a financial stack uh, nationwide and how uh, UPI is transforming financial payments uh, small businesses across the country. And this is a theme that the UN Secretary General's high level panel on digital cooperation, which I had the privilege of serving as executive director, which is co-chaired by Melinda Gates and Jack Ma, highlighted in its very first recommendation. 
that you need to build these common rails that allow innovation to scale, responsible innovation to scale, while providing for guardrails to ensure that there's no misuse and that there's inclusiveness and the rights of access and not being discriminated against are um, uh, respected. Now, in the health domain, India has taken these um, huge steps to move to a similar kind of a nationwide health uh, infrastructure, infrastructure that is accessible, affordable, interoperable. But this is not meant to create an infrastructure which will only be used by the public sector. Uh, it's, uh, it's in a sense, the leadership is coming from the government and uh, uh, other actors supported by the government, but the action really in terms of taking it to the last mile would be um, uh, the responsibility of a number of actors. And we'll hear from some of these actors uh, during the, uh, the panel uh, uh, today. I will close my remarks by just mentioning briefly what IDARE is and does. Uh, it's a new initiative and in follow up to the UNSG's high level panel. And the ambition is to prepare a launch uh, within two years by 2020, 2022, when India would be the G20 pres uh, president. And then to come to this launch with a research agenda for the future for AI and digital health, come to this launch with solid investment cases for these interoperable digital infrastructures and the capacity building uh, that is required to uh, 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 along with it. And to come to this launch with some early success stories from collaborative projects um, in different areas of uh, digital health. So we are well underway with support from a number of uh, partners across the globe. And we are doing this in a distributed hubs and spokes manner so that the emerging geographies of innovation in China, India, Africa, Latin America can play their due role and we can truly have collaborative research and development of uh, these uh, technologies. I will now turn to the first speaker on our panel, Dr. Indu Bhushan, who is the CEO of the National Health role, as Abhishek pointed out, in rolling out uh, this nationwide infrastructure for uh, digital health. Sir, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Amandeep. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Vadwani, very inspiring uh, comments. And also thank you for mentioning the two schemes that we run from National Health Authority. Uh, in my six minutes, I'll focus on what is uh, uh, NDHM, National Digital Health Mission, why we are doing it, and what is uh, that we are likely to achieve from uh, this mission. On why we are doing it, uh, it was uh, mentioned by Amandi that uh, uh, for uh, innovations, creativity, and many other objectives that we have in the health sector to, uh, to fructify, we need to have a backbone. And it would be good to see a parallel from hard infrastructure so that we can understand it better uh, in transport. Uh, it is the responsibility of the government to lay uh, the highways. And not only highways are to be laid, but also the rules uh, uh, setting the transport has to be laid. So once the highway is there, there will be uh, uh, there will be transport, there will be cars and trucks, uh, both public and private, uh, plying on the road. But at the same time, government has to decide about the rules. That, uh, it, so for example, in India, uh, they have to be on the left side. This is to be speed limit, and uh, the vehicles have to follow some norms in terms of emission, in terms of uh, the age and they have to register with the uh, agency so that uh, uh, they're safe to be driven on that road. Uh, similarly, there'll be a lot of activities which will come up along the road. Uh, on the highways, you'll have hotels, restaurants, shops, and government has to decide that how far they should be and what kind of activities are allowed uh, along the roadside. So same thing is going to be happening uh, with the health sector where we want to uh, provide a highway um, information highway, digital highway, on which uh, creativity and a lot of uh, other innovations can ride on at the same time, provide some rules of the game so that uh, they can, uh, the, the creativity can be harnessed in most efficient and effective manner. 
Uh, in this uh, National Digital Health Mission, we are going to be providing four things. One, uh, that every individual will get a health ID, uh, which will be a marker through which uh, their uh, electronic medical records uh, can be pulled and uh, can be shared with the consent, of course, uh, of the individual. Uh, all the healthcare providers, be they doctors, paramedical staff, uh, from allopathy, Ayurvedic, uh, or other Ayush fields, will also be mapped and given a unique ID. And all the health facilities, including hospitals, diagnostic centers, labs, uh, and others, will also get an ID. And uh, linking all this uh, will be a consent manager and a framework for health information exchange, where with the consent of the person, uh, the information can be pulled and aggregated together and shared uh, with whoever the person wants to uh, share that information with. And the principles which are underlying this are that uh, individual has to be at the center of the mission. Uh, and we are going to be following privacy and security by design. It's not that uh, we'll build the whole system and then think about private privacy and security, but in the design itself, they'll be ingrained and mainstreamed uh, as we go in terms of uh, privacy and security. We are working on a policy for health data management, uh, which uh, uh, very clearly defines how the data will be collected, stored, and shared and used. So, and uh, all that will be done uh, with a strict and informed uh, consent of the person who, with who the data belongs to. And finally, uh, inclusiveness will be one uh, major feature of uh, this uh, mission, where we are realizing that uh, there is a digital divide, uh, there is a lack of access to say internet or even uh, uh, mobile services in some parts of the country. Uh, we need to ensure that those uh, people are not um, uh, left behind, that they, they should be part of the uh, whole, whole system. And now, uh, what will it achieve? Uh, first of all, it will achieve continuum of care and so that people can take uh, uh, their records uh, right from the birth till death with them and they can ensure that primary health care, secondary health care, tertiary health care, all the records can be shared and uh, uh, me medical or uh, providers don't have to uh, assess or treat patient without uh, full information. Uh, second, it will of course make the uh, portability uh, much uh, more uh, uh, effective and uh, easier uh, moving from one doctor to other doctor, one facility to other facility so that uh, they don't lose uh, record on the way. It will make the system more transparent. People will be able to uh, get on to and uh, know more about uh, what is available, what kind of facilities are available, what kind of feedback uh, those facilities have received. And um, so they can make informed choice about where to go. Uh, it will make the system more accountable because the, uh, the kind of treatment which is being provided will be recorded, will be part of the system and uh, can be audited more easily. And finally, it will make system uh, the more evidence-based in terms of decision-making at the policy level. Uh, it will provide more data, in term, anonymized data for researchers to come out with the better, uh, better policy relevant uh, uh, research. So all that is going to happen in terms of uh, ultimate impact, but for private sector, I think it provides a huge amount of opportunity uh, because it will unleash a lot of uh, uh, creativity uh, as uh, Amandeep was saying, as happened in uh, through UPI, where FinTech has uh, transformed the uh, whole country in terms of, uh, of the financial sector. Uh, same thing it will happen uh, in the health, health sector. And a couple of examples that I can give is uh, uh, this uh, issue of telemedicine. Right now, telemedicine has a lot of uh, uh, regulatory issues, but with the National Digital Health Mission, where we can uh, identify which doctor is talking to you, we can identify which uh, hospital uh, is linked to that doctor, and uh, your electronic medical records being safe, uh, it will be much easier for us to expand the access to uh, telemedicine. Similarly, use of AI using uh, this ND, uh, NDHM uh, uh, will be uh, much, much easier. And we are expecting and hoping that a lot of uh, uh, private sector initiative will come, which will 
lead to a uh, lot of innovations within the sector, including a lot of focus on clinical decision support system. And uh, this NDHM will also help in terms of expanding the use of internet of medical things, uh, because we'll have the basic parameters um, within the system and within the uh, infrastructure provided by NDHM, uh, which can be uh, plugged uh, with the uh, internet of medical things. Now, we have also launched uh, the sandbox uh, where we've invited uh, applications from public and private sector entities. And I'm happy to report that more than 300 applications have been received and a lot of uh, private sector interest uh, has been shown in terms of how uh, they want to link with the uh, uh, NDHM. And uh, this uh, mission is just starting, is taking off. And in the meantime, we are seeing that there's a lot of demand coming uh, for the skills uh, uh, which are uh, needed for digital health. And as a matter of fact, we've been losing people from our organization who are going to private sector because there's a, suddenly a spurt in demand in digital health. So uh, that we see as a positive sign and see uh, that uh, we are unleashing a revolution uh, and uh, the uh, health sector will change for good in times to come. With that, I, I uh, finish my six minutes and remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Amandeep. Thank you very much, Dr. Indu Bhushan, uh, for those remarks, the substantive content, and also sticking to the time limit. So we are perfectly on time with all our speakers uh, so far, and I'm sure that will continue. So this is uh, uh, the right moment for us to pivot to a participant from the private sector, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy from Apollo Hospitals, a chain that has revolutionized uh, healthcare delivery in uh, parts of the world. I lived in Sri Lanka, Colombo, so I've seen the Apollo Hospital there. Uh, and with COVID as well, we've seen with your risk management app, how you have now pivoted to the digital opportunity. So over to you, Sangeeta. So namaste and good evening. It's uh, indeed a pleasure to be speaking at a conference like this and to follow inspirational speakers like uh, Mr. Sunil Vadwani of Mr. Indubushan, uh, Mr. Vadwani showed us the art of the possible. Mr. Indubushan has uh, built up the building blocks for enabling the art of the possible. And uh, it's for us now as, as private sector to really uh, take this and run with it. So uh, just a, a brief uh, minute in terms of introduction for those who don't know, I, uh, besides Fiki, of course, I, I represent Apollo Hospitals which is one of India's largest healthcare providers, but besides beds and high-end care, you know, we have over 10,000 beds, but we also have uh, clinics, pharmacies, uh, educational institutions, nurses training, and a very great commitment to remote healthcare uh, and, and rural healthcare and primary care. So uh, I want to begin by uh, first acknowledging uh, the, the tremendous role that the government has played and just echoing some of the earlier speakers, but very briefly acknowledging that this reimagining the Indian healthcare scenario, the enablement of primary healthcare uh, through the strengthening of the, uh, the primary healthcare centers, which is a very important pivot of the entire uh, aspect of the national health policy, in addition to Ayushman Bharat, uh, are two very significant moves. And the third important pillar is the National Digital Health Mission. A combination of these three, of universal healthcare, of a stronger primary healthcare system, and the third pillar is the data. Uh, and the enablement of this disparate kind of health system to come together is really a dream and a vision that you know, we've had for the last 20 years. 20 years ago, two things happened in, you know, which, which set me on this journey. Number one is that we did our first teleconsult 20 years ago, connecting my father's village with one of our high-end hospitals so that a person in rural India could have the benefit of that. And actually, President Bill, Bill Clinton was visiting India and he said, I'm amazed with what India can do. And I hope that we keep amazing the world. But this went on that I actually then started studying the subject, looking at the, you know, the various implications and while our own hospital information systems were growing and evolving, I realized that one of the important aspects of healthcare is that healthcare is not the hospital alone. The hospital is getting unbundled 
And the continuum of care is the important thing. And putting the patient or the individual at the center of care is one of the most important things. So actually when, and then the uniformity of data and what they call semantic interoperability. So that what one person says, what a doctor calls a heart attack uh, is a myocardial infarction for the cardiologist and is a chest pain for the patient. So it's the same thing, but it's called three different things and the computer will not know that this is the same thing. So this ability to standardize coding and create semantic interoperability is at the foundation of the baseline of this enabled ecosystem. And so 20 years ago, I actually went to the health ministry and said, you know, this is what we need to start doing. We have to have standards in our data capture. We have to integrate. Uh, we need an EMR. Uh, we must have systems that talk to each other. And I was told at this point of time that, you know, this is not the time we're battling with polio and TB and, you know, what is this IT and data system? But I actually took the same thought to the IT ministry and created the first document. We worked on a pro bono basis and many others came in. And Health Unite is the uh, document that the Ministry of IT and uh, health put together along with our thing to talk about this. And this has evolved over the years, standards for electronic health records, standard treatment guidelines. Uh, uh, you know, the, and today I'm so happy to see the government leading this whole initiative of the National Data Health Mission. In March, uh, the telemedicine guidelines were officially launched and, uh, you know, Niti Ayo, Mr. Indubush and VK Paul have really pushed at that. And then the NDHM mission in August 2020, the first ID scenario came. So now, you know, kind of putting this back into the Apollo ecosystem is that, uh, you know, we, we have over the last 10, 15 years been working on a UHID. We currently have over a 20 million records. And then we said that patients who come to us are patients, they're sick. How do we look at population health? So we adopted in our village, which were actually my father, where the place where my father was born, a cluster of 70 villages to create this concept of total health from birth through life and began to document primary health care, preventive health care interventions that can bring down the burden of disease. So all these have evolved over the years. We, you know, and I was so inspired to hear uh, Mr. Sunil Vadwani's both comments. One is the great work that they're doing. And second is the concept of collaboration because uh, we are running out of our remote healthcare division about uh, 250 clinics for different governments, primary healthcare, very similar device technology, but the physical, you know, back end of doing this perfectly. Uh, are very committed to telemedicine. We do approximately 25,000 teleconsults a day, whether it's free for some ecosystems, for the government, for our own patients. And so we understand and appreciate. And now, if you look at virtual care or telemedicine, the next bastion is the using remote care to enhance what you can do in telemedicine. So put the devices out there whether it's the stethoscope or uh, various other aspects. And the third pillar in that environment is artificial intelligence. And why are we connecting these three? We're connecting them so that care can reach the unreached. We're connecting them so that we can enable what I believe is a very, very important shift. And that shift is that care is moving from the hospital to the clinic, from the clinic to the home, and from the home to a 24 by seven ubiquitous access to care. And this shift is very, very important because of another shift which is happening. And that shift is that for the first time in many, many years, uh, last year in India, the impact of non-communicable disease was higher than the impact of communicable disease. And if you look at that aspect, that means that what is happening is while this shift is moving from hospital into ubiquitous access, the shift is also moving from hospital-centric care. Many years ago, it was GP-centric. Then it became hospital-centric. And now in this move, the responsibility of care is moving to the individual because non-communicable disease are primarily about lifestyle. So now you need to equip this individual with the knowledge and the capability to do something very, very important. And that is to prevent disease. 
So we don't treat only patients, but we enable individuals to stay healthy. It is only when we take this dual approach to care that we will create the whole new ecosystem by reducing the burden of requirement. Uh, there's, there is a lot more that can be spoken, but I realize that my time is up. So I just want to end by saying one more thing, and that is that at the high end of this, we have to approach it from different paths, the prevention, the primary health care, but also that with the shortage of healthcare workers across the country and across the world, that we must use AI to enable some of the fresh doctors to operate the highest level as if he's been practicing for 20 years. So experience can get encapsulated in artificial intelligence, which will enable the fresh doctor and even the nurse to bring up care. And again, my last, last point is that this was something which was said by the published, the editor of Lancet, is that we're not facing a pandemic of COVID. We're actually in the midst of a tridemic. And that tridemic is number one, COVID. Number two, a bigger one, which is making COVID worse, which is non-communicable disease because comorbidities is increasing mortality. And the third important one is an infodemic because there is so much information. What is the right information and how do you put it into the pillars which have been created so that we deliver appropriate care and enable the right kind of behavior for a happier and a healthier population because ultimately health is really at the core of the happiness of the world. Uh, and AI is going to enable us to reach these goals faster and better. So let's all find ways to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sangeeta. Wow, There's, there was a lot in there. Thank you so much. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, I just, you know, love this subject. And so sorry. True and all these points are, are so, so relevant to our discussion. Maybe we shift now. Uh, uh, to a different geography with Chris, uh, who joins us from the UK. So Chris, if you can talk about the UK's experience with digital health, you can pioneer with the HDR, with the NHSX. Um, what are the lessons that you can talk about that can be um, emulated in other uh, countries? Um, how is the digital dimension of the COVID-19 response something that Sangeeta started to get us into? Well, thank you, Sandeep. Um, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where you are around the world. And um, thank you for firstly inviting me on this panel of highly respected speakers and peers. As mentioned, my name is Chris Suter and I'm the head of Digital Cloud Platforms and Innovation at the NHS Business Services Authority in the UK. The NHS BSA is an arms length body of the UK's Department of Health and Social Care scene, and its basic function is business operations in the wider NHS. But I'll come more on to that later. Firstly, I just want to paint the picture of about the NHS in the UK. So the NHS is the fifth largest employer in the world, employing roughly 1.7 million people to care for the 67 million people making up the UK's population. In its now since second year, it was set up to deliver healthcare for the people of the UK free of charge at the point of entry. And over the years has become one of the leaders in adopting technology for good, with a goal of using technology and data to improve patient medical outcomes. This includes in 1958, for example, the first use of ultrasound in the world's medical um, profession. In 1991, the first use of robotics in surgery within the NHS and more recently in 2013 with the first installation of a full bionic arm on a UK patient. The NHS and the wider UK government is always looking at up and coming technologies to help our citizens. But with a focus on using technologies, there is a need there to help and not to want to use it, that technology because it is there. Technology should be focused on user needs and the tools to help people and not just become an obstruction in the way of progression. This is why in 2011, the UK government formed the Government Digital Service, or GDS for short, with the aim of the department bringing unity of technology usability together and aligning UK digital services across the board. This was based on the general design principles to make technology open for all, not just UK citizens, but anybody visiting and residing within the UK. And this to be a catalyst to all public sector organisations within the UK to align to digital standards. 
principles include making services simple to navigate, to be open and coherent for the end users, to be conformable to using digital services for all their needs, not just for the few who can access the internet, for example. This has also allowed public sector departments, including the NHS, to access approved technology standards and frameworks that we could build upon to deliver these services to our best of our abilities and to remove the duplication of effort, but the enablement of sharing data for research design patterns and our code to other departments around the world, not just the NHS. Over time, this has extended into our infrastructure to host web-based and internal applications within the UK government. And out of this came the UK's first cloud first policy which was created to advise and any new platforms creating within the UK public sector should look to or using private sector organisations in cloud-based technologies. Alongside this also came the new UK's data classification standards, which allowed the UK public sector organisations to understand the impact and sensitivity of the data which we hold, how safe to store that and maintain integrity of that data throughout the systems and its data life cycles. These classifications are set up underneath the headers of sensitive, official sensitive, secret and top secret. And this allows security our data to be easily assessed and the correct control being put in place around our data, especially around the medical use and our patient's data. With most UK citizens' patient data being classed as official sensitive, this was the enabler to use our cloud technologies for storing and data processing of that information. So back to the NHS. So over a 72 year period, we have been collecting data in many forms and in many, many physical formats and buildings, including hospitals, doctor surgeries, dentists, in filing cabinets and in brown envelopes. These records containing patient information, which have been collected for the sole purpose of that healthcare organization and no other. This in turn caused a number of issues as you come here as well, I guess. And as a patient's entire medical history was split, duplicated or missing crucial information for other organizations, this became an issue in itself. So fast forward to the 1990s and steps have been made with the help of digital technologies with paper-based records now being digitized and being enablement of computers to store that information. But still there was issues of the data sharing of these records and other healthcare organizations and with patients themselves not having access to the entire medical record or history, things got lost and medical details slipped underneath the rug. So back in 2018, Matt Hancock, who is the UK Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, embraced the need for an integrated healthcare system within the UK. With data sharing being the heart of it between healthcare and social care organisations being a requirement for these systems to integrate more efficiently. This will be an enabler to allow the patients in the UK to get the best treatment based on their entire medical history and social care settings. Since then, a lot of changes have been made in healthcare, which combines the UK government digital strategy in digital, cloud first, open sourcing, alongside data sharing agreements within the health and social care sectors within the UK, public, private based, and also with academia. These strategies for driving data sharing has allowed integration of care systems that have served the UK's people as much as they can and making their data work for them and accessing accessibility by them. This includes, for example, our national summary care record that any UK healthcare authority can now access on that patient's medical history, past, present, or any future appointments which are in their calendars. A centralised NHS app which allows UK citizens to access their own medical data, giving them access to see repeat medication, medication information, allowing them to book consultations and doctors and also to understand what data has been held on them. And lastly, enabling research on that data to help advancements in healthcare we deliver whether that be through population healthcare studies carried out by our UK health data research for drug trials or through the understanding of human genomes by Genomics England. Behind the NHS, we have the primary focus of medical care as a driver to adopt digital technologies to improve UK population health through business operations, data and also insights. 
In 2019, the formation of NHSX came about with a focus on being the authority for developing the best practice in technology, digital and data within our NHS settings. Along with NHSX, we also have NHS Digital, who are responsible for looking after technology within the medical care settings, primary care, secondary care and tertiary. With ourselves, the NHS Business Services Authority, who manage the day-to-day -day business operations within the NHS. Working as a collective unit of lead organisations, we are changing innovation and delivering solutions to user needs and not technology wants. As mentioned before, we are the business operations arm of the NHS, keeping the wheels turning the lights on, looking after key services, such as patient services, managing their medical exemption records, UK citizen services, processing medical prescription data, workforce services, management of the recruitment, the payment and the pensions of the 1.7 million absolutely outstanding staff who work for us. And then also organising overseas healthcare for our UK citizens, whether they're travelling abroad on holiday or emigrating to another country. As a result of this, to help deliver our services, we use a number of technology pillars to enable for responding to populations healthcare needs. These include our cloud technology platforms, so hosting our digital applications on national and international scale. The use of artificial intelligence, for example, in our contact centres, we deliver AI front-ended services to deliver information directly to people's questions over the phone. Machine learning, we have adopted this technology all heartily and using these technologies, we are extracting data from medical records, from the old services we used to own, but also from paper-based records we have now and making digital so information and data can be extracted from them. And as a result, the data analysis is there to drive the insights and spot trends in healthcare in the UK and understand what possible treatments are out there. And all this is possible with our open sourcing standards as well. So enabling people to use our technology we, we create, but also allowing them to basically adopt our technology and we adopt theirs as well, whether that be public sector, private sector or academia. These pillars have allowed rapid adoption and agile developments and nothing has shown this more than our recent COVID-19 crisis that is hitting the world. The UK population within the NHXX, NHX Digital and BSA working collectively in a partnership have delivered 40 plus COVID-19 related services on a national scale, all this within the five months. Some of these services include text messaging services to inform people based off their medical history, which we hold to basically stay at home and stay safe and isolate during this crisis. Rapidly also expanding our NHS helplines using voice automation to deliver the information and guidance instantly to people reporting symptoms, again, to stay at home and stay safe or seek medical advice. Building digital applications on cloud platforms that can scale to meet demands of UK population. For example, when our service went live for requesting home kits for COVID-19 tests, our service was inundated with requests for these. And with our help of our partners, including Amazon, not only for their web-based systems, but also for their delivery centers and distribution, we managed to roll these out within nine days. Uh, Chris, if I may, let's, uh, I think, uh, speed up a little bit because we have very limited time. So if you can uh, conclude in the, the next 30 seconds, that'll be nice. Thanks. No problem. So out of all this, lessons that I would like to share with the experience are the foundations, getting enablers and levers in place, such as strategies, principles, standards and frameworks, getting standards and frameworks in place to use digital services across healthcare settings, allowing the coherent experience with all organisations. Drivers, understanding the end user and their needs, and let it be a driver of technology choice. Data. Data is great, but delivering better outcomes for patients if shared across wider healthcare organizations and wider research communities. And lastly, open, be transparent with your data and your patients so they can trust that the data is correct and accurate and allow data to be used for good. Thank you so much for this time and opportunity to be a member of this panel and I'll hand back to Mandeep. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, and a lot of remarks, questions in the chat box. They uh, uh, the audience has started engaging with the speakers. That's very good to see. 
Uh, so at this point, let me turn to Sanjay, who will bring us a perspective from AWS, from the, uh, the US uh, perspective of a tech giant moving into uh, healthcare and data for healthcare. Sanjay, over to you. You have your five, six minutes. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll, I'll try, to be, uh, try, try to be respectful of the time. Uh, so like, like Sunil said, and, and Avandip, I, I also came from a very rural sector of India and, and, and studied uh, in, in, in various parts. Uh, currently, I lead many of the AWS research activities. Uh, so today, I'll, I'll briefly talk about a couple of examples in order to really implement it at a scale. Uh, so can I uh, share my slides just just to uh, just to give a uh, give a prospect? Can you see uh, can you see my screen? Yes, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'll briefly introduce uh, introduce what what is required. Generally, people require for uh, for digital health or what many people call it precision health, uh, the, the role AI can play. And one thing I really want to emphasize, in, one really need an infrastructure to do that. Infrastructure is not, is, 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 is really vital uh, to lower the barrier to, to entry by all, all, all stakeholders. And then what are the engagements and collaboration strategies? Collaboration is vital. I'll, I'll, I'll briefly touch base on that. So here is one example. Uh, you know, what, we all talked about that, uh, connecting, essentially connecting various uh, clinical sector can save life. Here is it, an integrated clinical platform, we all talked about that. And here is this example, Marcy is a 40 plus hospital system in the US. Every month there are 700 patients that are admitted with one condition called the, the, the heart failure. So what they did without without integrated clinical system, uh, the heart uh, the the immortality rate was roughly about five percent or about roughly about thirty five patients a month. So what they did is they brought together all the clinical uh, variables, uh, including vital signs, lab results, medication into a single platform. It's not only about bringing data, data harmonization; it's also bringing the clinical literatures. Uh, topic modeling or natural language processing can do that. And this way, a, a set of doctors can see based on uh, data harmonization, what are the treatment pathways. And, and with that, just for one particular disease, uh, for the heart conditions, they say 480 lives and also $27 million. So data harmonization in a, in a, in a, in a, in a clinical platform is extremely vital. Here's the second example. Clinical data is not enough. Genetic sequencing has to play key role. Uh, 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 Amanda in this particular picture, she uh, had a very unusual, extremely high cholesterol and a so-called uh, bad fat in the liver. Her, her cholesterol was something like 2,700 milligrams per, 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 per deciliter. Generally, you know, cholesterols typically triglycerides are okay with about 150. But slowly over the, over the course of five to 10 years, her, her triglyceride level started increasing from 2,700 to 10,000. And of course, she was given all the clinical medications uh, to lower the cholesterol and nothing happened. In 2015, uh, the cholesterol went to more than 10,000. So it started affecting the kidney itself. And again, all the clinical variables were fine. Doctors, she got the best treatment at, at, at Yale Hospital. And, do, and, and it's, they were very close to operating her kidney up. But uh, one of the doctor in Yale New York Heaven, they said, well, let me, let's have a look at uh, her genetic profile. So he requested genomic sequencing uh, for, uh, for, for, uh, uh, for uh, in her case. And what came out was that in the sequencing, uh, they found a, a particular gene called PPARG that stood out as a culprit uh, that is really responsible to store fatty cells inside a given bloodstream. And that particular gene or exome mutated. 
They also did sequencing of her parents and realize and, 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 and try to see a difference. And parents never had that gene mutation. So instead of this thousands of dollars uh, or, or billions of dollars she spent every day doctors since the last 20 years, one genetic sequencing uh, with $20 medicine just to uh, just to just to uh, lower uh, or give give a change in hormone fat hormone uh, cured her and she is well and fine. So I think genetic sequencing has to become part of daily life. It has to be part of birth right. It's not that expensive. People spend a lot of money in in 23andMe, and the cost at a population scale like India uh, that that can that can reduce quite a lot and save life. The third variable which is is also vital. Is, is longitudinal data or, or wearables. Here is one example of, of Kinsa Insight. Uh, Kinsa is a smart uh, thermometer. And at a population scale, if you, if you de-identify it and aggregate it, you can roughly know what is the blood body temperature of a, of a set of people at a given cluster. And Kinsa started working on in that. And, and based on that, one can uh, predict or where a given set of fever or outbreak can happen. A uh, lot of other companies like Amazon came with uh, Helio, uh, Halo, uh, Aura Ring is, is, is something similar that provides body temperature, heart variable to respiratory and, and other activity level. Uh, for a long time, people thought, uh, you know, genetic sequence or gene can be, uh, can pan out all the, all the disease aspect, but many, many, many diseases like diabetes, it's, it's a combination of genetics as well as lifestyle. So in order to create really a, a, a integrated digital platform, one need to combine all the three, clinical genetic as well as wearable and longitudinal variable. Uh, and, and healthcare is facing a paradigm shift. Each of the entity is exploding by itself, right? Uh, we, are, we are, you know, predictive insight can only in, uh, be, be obtained by bringing patient health record, genetic wearable informant factor. Uh, let me give you an example. Imagine somebody came out uh, from a, uh, from a PTSD, right? L just looking at the activity level, you cannot know the whole profile. Combining these three, uh, how many times he went to the do doctor? What are the uh, what are what are the uh, medication prescribed? What is genetic profiles are based? Uh, combining these three, one should be able to uh, uh, provide a given prediction. And, and as you can imagine, there is no centralized system at this moment to, to gather, integrate, and derive insight to a complex data. And, and, and regulations are there at, at, at a given level. So, so I think one of the major part would be uh, the major barrier to bringing digital health uh, is, is not really the cost, it's actually the infrastructure combining these aspects. And, and, and at, at a large scale, uh, the cost of course will, will, will come down. Uh, here is one example of recent activities we did, uh, and, 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 and there are two players actually in the game, right? So one is the clinicians. Uh, so, so, so one is, is the research community who are really builders, and they need a, 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 a secure, anonymized set of data sets at the population level to, 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 to come, come up with a given, a given result. And the second uh, stakeholder is the, are the doctors. They want predefined treatment pathway we based on a aggregate cohort. For example, in a given hospital system, if you just, uh, with, with X set of patients, if you just build the cohort and say, what are the treatment pathways, you will immediately come to a given, given results. So here in, for the COVID, for example, we recently worked with, uh, with uh, COVID data commons just to provide that. And it's, 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 it's uh, open to public or researcher with any given ID. So this is really to explore, analyze and share data to improve health outcome. Uh, similarly, the infrastructure also should be able to provide the advancement in, in technology. It's not only about data sharing, but you also need those kind of processing system. So Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in this particular example, uh, if you do genomic sequencing with thousands of CPUs, it'll take weeks and months. So these folks, they use uh, something called FPGAs or Amazon F1 instances. This is field programmable gate arrays. And they, can, they could do 1,000 genomic sequencing in, 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 in two hours uh, and 25 minutes. They also got the Guinness Book of World Record here. The next aspect is how do we also enable researchers, uh, but in a very secure environment? Um, uh, this was done by UCSD. So you, you can 
have a collection data with set of uh, set of processing tool, but also security built into it. So in this particular one, uh, uh, in, in Tag Bio, within a given Amazon workspace, for example, uh, the, the clinicians and the researchers are actually defined what we call virtual research desktop that connects both, and for a given cohort, in, in this case, lung cancer, uh, that connects actually the application technology as well as the knowledge uh, from, uh, from that. This is being used at the UC Health. We also work with National Institute of Health uh, just for that reason, to, to, to have uh, a data set under STRIDES program up, uh, available for no cost to all the public in the country. Uh, we call it the program called STRIDES, details are here. Uh, recently, very recently, uh, with the NIH National Institute of Health, uh, we also released a sequenced read archive data sets uh, anyone in the public uh, should be able to use it for, uh, for, for analytics. Once we bring them data sets, you know, analytic tools, then one can, can do machine learning or AI. And here is, is this example, UC Health, uh, they just convolution, did convolution neural net. Imagine you have a COVID, the first symptoms in pneumonia. And if you take an X-ray, uh, convolution neural net can, can immediately recognize the difference between the standard pneumonia or COVID related effects. And this was the study to, which was done at uh, UC Health or UCSD uh, that uses AI to quickly uh, detect uh, something different than pneumonia. Uh, similarly, uh, AI can, once you have the data sets at a single place connecting these variables in this particular study, uh, one can uh, just look at background only hypothesis, any, any, any difference in nerve vessels, you should be able to tell if somebody has a diabetics affecting the nerve vessels. So AI can uh, uh, help, but the infrastructure is the key. Uh, this, in this particular example, a skin ca cancer one can detect uh, based on AI convolution neural and all. One can also use AI for 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 uh, for for de identification areas. In this example here, uh, atopic modeling has been used in order to de identify the PHI parameters. So, in in conclusion, I think I, I really want to stress that infrastructure is a key and engaging each stakeholder differently, like doctors, uh, uh, doctors are not builders, they, they, don't, they are executors. Uh, uh, providing them the tool differently than the researcher, as well as engaging the patient by providing some kind of a personal health record is the key in, in getting the success. I hope I'm in time, uh, so with that I stop. Thank you so much for inviting, it's, it's, it's really a pleasure to to join, uh, thank you, Sanjay, for that presentation. Thank you for, for uh, sharing your perspective, bringing those slides as well into the discussion. So uh, ke keeping an eye on the time, we seem to be uh, 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 not doing that well now. But let's try and uh, speed up. And uh, I'll give the floor to Dr. Sriram Murthy, the CEO of Quadratix. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, those were uh, very interesting comments, um, Sanjay, on the infrastructure, the algorithms, um, and the um, uh, you know collaborations that are needed to implement uh, uh, you know implement effective solutions. What I would like to do is to um, step back and look at the uh, overall problem of uh, transforming uh, the current care into the new connected uh, healthcare. I would like to look at it as an AI-driven digital transformation. Uh, Canada, as you know, has a, a national health system like uh, uh, the UK. And uh, one of the parameters that they really wanted to improve is the average amount of waiting time that a person had before they could uh, access uh, formal care. And in India, those that quantity may be something else. Uh, so for example, it could be the disparity of mortality that we have between um, the rural and urban locations or between the uh, different socioeconomic strata. Uh, we have, uh, for example, in 2019, between a poor male uh, in a rural area to a rich male in an urban area, there was almost a 13.2 years of difference in terms of life expectancy in India. Um, and the numbers are similar for uh, women, about 15% of the lifespan. That's the difference, about 11.2 years. 
um, so that could be a, a objective that one is trying to uh, achieve is re reduce the discrepancy using uh, different measures that one takes for digital transformation. It could be the per capita cost of healthcare um, uh, that uh, uh, you know someone uh, needs to put in, whether it's a government or the individual that is spending for it. The overall cost might be something that we are trying to bring down. So one of the first things we need to do to uh, define this exercise correctly is to have a uh, objective, a goal articulated so that we can then monitor it and make sure that we are proceeding in the right direction as different transformation measures are put in place. The uh, second thing to do is to understand the uh, journey of the beneficiary in this case. In a commercial context, we would call it a customer journey. Uh, India is a diverse uh, uh, situation. India has diverse situations. There are people that uh, access healthcare in very diverse ways. Dr. Indubhushan was mentioning, for example, uh, Ayush, which is a large uh, group of uh, uh, caregivers. And uh, a lot of uh, caregiving happens in the uh, family uh, or through practices, individual preventive practices that uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy spoke about. Um, so it's very, very important for us to understand the uh, segments of beneficiaries in the health system and the journeys that they take so that that can then be mapped into what are the pieces that need to be more efficient through the use of AI, through the use of data? What are the decision, uh, decisions that need to be partially or fully automated? So it's important to go outward in from the uh, requirement of a customer journey to the optimizations that one needs to put in place. This is the second point I want to make. The third point is on data. Um, AI can be extremely useful in terms of uh, making care data repositories at the customer level. Uh, we are seeing, uh, for example, from the National E-Governance Division projects like Umang, which uh, keep a thin layer on top of the existing data repositories in different places to make that data accessible to uh, you know, different uh, stakeholders. Um, we also have uh, uh, you know, one of the companies that uh, presented yesterday in the uh, in the competition, AI competition, uh, the air scanner, which can take different language documents and bring that data uh, effectively into the uh, uh, you know into the data repository. And there are conversational agents. Uh, the NLP sessions in this conference have been talking about them. The conversational agents, which can be useful not just to pass information to the the, to the patient, but also to uh, you know have frequent touch points with the patient, which are not possible through uh, nurses or doctors because of because it's already a constrained um, uh, system in terms of number of people available. Uh, but it's possible for AI to have uh, touch points on you know what kind of effects are you experiencing from a drug that is prescribed to you. And as, uh, having that conversation in the in their uh, native language and getting that data into some kind of a system. So um, collecting of data, both behavioral and clinical data, uh, through innovative means AI can be of immense help. This is the third uh, um, third component. The fourth component I want to address, and this is the penultimate component. The fourth one is the optimizations that need to be done at the systems level. Um, uh, Honorable Prime Minister, uh, in his address at the beginning of the conference, uh, spoke about how resource allocation can be optimized. Um, a, currently, the issue is that certain places, there are there's a dearth of resources, and certain places, there are uh, resources that are over-deployed. And uh, uh, it, when I say resources, it's not just human uh, resources. It could be equipment. It could be uh, you know, certain types of data availability, et cetera. And it's important that once we understand the customer journeys, we identify the pieces that need to be optimized in terms of resource allocation. Um, even something as simple as proper appointment setting can reduce the uh, dangers due to, uh, you know, due to crowding at a, at a point of care. Um, so that's the fourth component of optimizing resources. The fifth component is virtualized personalized care. So if you think of resource optimization as a back end, this is the front end of the solution. Um, it is possible to provide different types of virtualized care and personalized care uh, to the patient to achieve what uh, uh, Dr. Sangeeta Reddy referred to as the ubiquitous uh, care. 
and there are multiple components to this kind of a um, uh, this kind of a virtualized care it could be some it could be for example having a community of uh, people with similar requirements which can be then addressed by caregivers um, or it could be a, a secure sharing of information between uh, uh, you know somebody that needs the care and somebody that's providing the care and it, or it could be a um, uh, you know, uh, health coaches or teleconsultations that have been talked about. So um, the fifth component is how do we ensure that the patient remains at the center of the care and AI uh, is used, AI is wonderful for personalization once we have the types of data that I commented about. So how do we ensure that an individual is at the center of the care and different types of uh, services are provided to them to ensure a seamless connectivity between physical care touch points and ubiquitous digital care. So that would be the uh, fifth component. So I think by addressing these five components, effective digital transformation, the AI driven digital transformation can be brought about in uh, healthcare, which we are here uh, referring to as the new connected healthcare. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Murthy. I'll turn now to Andrew, who's been waiting patiently. He woke up very early in Seattle to join us on this uh, panel. So Andrew, over to you to bring uh, us perhaps a global perspective uh, from the Gates Foundation's uh, uh, viewpoint. Thanks so much, Anandeep. And, and thanks to all of the other speakers. I, I think this is a very uh, dynamic and interesting discussion and people have brought their different uh, perspectives that all impact the opportunities that AI have. And uh, I, I have this uh, privilege of being the, the last speaker before we have Q&A, so I will make these brief. But uh, as part of my background, I'm a physician scientist, just as uh, Amandeep mentioned. So I trained as an oncologist and in oncology, we have already been bringing uh, data to uh, the concept of precision medicine. But uh, in the focus at the Gates Foundation, we have really been building a strategy around ensuring uh, data interoperability first and foremost. So uh, topics that you've heard from some of the other speakers with respect to uh, ensuring the foundation for data to reach all the way to the person at the point of care, uh, be that in a facility like an Apollo hospital or all the way in their home, if it's uh, through a frontline worker, uh, such as an ASHA or an a we have been finding paths <clears throat> to ensure that uh, beyond uh, bringing those data through that the standardization and coding uh, is something that Dr. Reddy had mentioned as well within the Apollo hospital efforts uh, can lead to the impact that we anticipate to be both proactive and to lead to better care outcomes. But our main goal has been uh, not just to build this infrastructure, but really to advance uh, the, the modes in which people can access care, either private or public sector, and ensure that we can break down the barriers that have existed uh, traditionally within global health with respect to uh, siloed efforts that have been much more focused first on communicable diseases and increasingly on non-communicable diseases, but often uh, simple campaigns that have been uh, not looking at the person holistically. And we have been uh, very fortunate to work with a number of the groups that are represented on this panel uh, and, and found paths through which we can take uh, the, the, the core element of a, of a, a, a uh, question, say uh, Dr. Wadwani was mentioning earlier around the tuberculosis uh, screening uh, efforts. That's, that's an effort that we are uh, very proud to also fund uh, with the Wadwani Institute. And, and thinking about ways that we can expand out. So start with tuberculosis, but then think about how is it that people are presenting. Now, uh, in, the, in the face of this uh, tridemic, as we heard earlier on the panel of COVID-19, we recognize that there is going to be absolutely uh, a question for many people who may present with symptoms that could be conflated uh, between COVID-19 or tuberculosis or another pneumonia. And so, Herein is the conundrum where we don't have a workforce necessary in most of the uh, low and middle income countries, and certainly not in high income countries either, who are capable of making such a determination without technologies. And technology has been a one way ratchet in costs, as we've heard earlier. Uh, in most of the world, we have seen that as you introduce new technologies in the healthcare systems, uh, costs just rise. And, and so AI and this data interoperability platforms, we think, for the first time, we may be able to demonstrate 
that a, uh, a primary health system that can address people where they are in their home, in their communities, or uh, in a local health post with tools that augment the health worker to level the care up uh, fundamentally could drive uh, either keep costs the same or actually reduce costs by having better outcomes. We have not seen that transformation occur in high income countries that have adopted uh, telehealth. Even within the UK, we heard earlier from Chris uh, around these adoption paths, but really this has been a, a question of displacement um, or, or not a question of displacement, of, uh, one of, of augmentation, right? If you make something easier for people to uh, consume, right? So this consumer uh, based approach that uh, the Dr. Murthy was just mentioning, then uh, it's much more likely that they're going to consume it, right? And, and this is true even in capitated systems like the NHS. I, I believe that where we can get to is this proactive component where a health system really is there to care for an individual, to understand what's happening to them, and to rather than waiting for a person to present, to uh, to be able to come back and and inform, a, you know, a, a set of actions that they might be able to take. And so, from the global perspective, we have been making investments in each of these individual pilots. We have been working with uh, multilateral groups and other foundations to find paths to build this interoperable system and to support. Uh, the transformation, not just to digitize the work that is done, but truly change the fundamental way that healthcare is provided. And, and we're very, very uh, happy to be part of this collaborative uh, global effort. And uh, among the things that we see as, as critical to this, of course, as has been the theme in, in almost every talk on this panel, the data infrastructure and the types of data that are collected are the very, very core. Uh, but moving beyond that, we, we do think that uh, work uh, such as the work that IDARE is beginning this year uh, is going to be critical in ensuring that we find paths to, to build up the, um, the ethics and the algorithms around how to handle these data and how to make the impact uh, most scalable. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak and looking forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. So we don't need to really sum up with that intervention. <laughs> you brought it all together. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, for the Q&A session. Uh, Equipment manufacturers, there are very, very few manufacturers. 3D scans at 10 frames a second of, um, of babies. And from that, we built this model. Um, our long-term goal is to, uh, like I said, go beyond weight to length, head circumference, and other parameters, integrate into healthcare and nutrition programs, and look at the first thousand days of life beyond newborns, to the first month and eventually the, uh, the, uh, the first thousand days. And with that, I'll pause. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul, for that presentation. Uh, so we, we've come to the end of our panel. I just want to see if uh, Abhishek is still with us as our host. Fine. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm here. So we still have some time. So would you like to take, take some questions? Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, if you think we have uh, time uh, at this point. We, we have around 24 minutes more. The session is 7 o'clock IST. It's uh, 6.36. So we have around 20 minutes. So I think you can deliberate on some of the questions that have been asked. Fantastic. So. Uh, Good that we have this time, and uh, let let me then pick up one of the questions uh, uh, for our UK friend Chris. Uh, so uh, the question, Chris, is about the use of AI in the COVID pandemic, and how do you incentivize stakeholders to share their data to create a unified uh, healthcare data platform? So if you can speak a little bit about the incentives that you've discovered through your work in the UK on uh, sharing of health healthcare data? Um, yes, so for us, um, literally one of the main parts was, as I said, the, the openness of our data. So using our, based our centralized app, we have our patients, our NHS app, we can get that data there and send it across in that centralized location, which is managed by NHS Digital. The incentive there is that we can then share that out, I said to the third parties, which are using um, COVID related tools such as our friends at um, Oxford University who are currently developing a vaccine there. Again, as you can understand that everybody's very, very keen to get a vaccine for this 
disease which is out there affecting everybody. Um, so from that perspective, uh, what we're trying to do is actually give them as much data as possible within restraints, with the restraint being that it's nominized. So no personal data there is actually pushed forward, but all the things we're sending through is helpful, such as lights of um, heights, weights, um, age limits Thank and you, such. Chris. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, there is another question, which is about the predictive power of uh, AI-driven analytic, analytics. So how do we predict lifestyle diseases, occupational hazards, uh, environmental health hazards by looking at diverse data sets, uh, demographic data, uh, social determinants of health data, uh, so this this question, uh, perhaps you know, Sangeeta, do you want to take this question uh, and and bring an example to the discussion from Apollo's experience in 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 uh, the preventive health care um, uh, aspect of this shift that you underlined? I think we may have lost Sangeeta. You know, I, I think Rahul may have a good perspective on this because Vadwani AI is doing work on how do we integrate different data sets uh, to bring to bear on healthcare issues. Uh, basically the use of contextual data uh, in healthcare. So Rahul, perhaps you could take a crack at this. Uh, sure, happy to share some. Um, yeah, as, as you framed it, I mean, the lots of correlates of health. Um, I, I, but in the question, I saw a few parts. Uh, yes, well, context matters a lot in healthcare. And so, for example, a person, person um, I mean, the example I use is you and me having a cough means something very different from a person from a Mumbai slum having a cough, right? And the difference is context. Um, and, and the latter is likely to be TB. And so we have a program uh, backed by the Gates Foundation on how do we incorporate contextual data into uh, healthcare decision-making. Uh, we are applying this to maternal and newborn health, to tuberculosis, um, as well as now in our COVID work. Uh, you heard a little bit about some of the cough, um, screening with cough that we're using and we're using contextual data there as well. Um, but I, I think some of this is also about lifestyle diseases and how do you uh, actually engage in preventative health. Uh, there I'll say it's not solely a technology problem, unfortunately, right? Uh, prevention is the holy grail of healthcare. But we know that uh, prevent, prevention requires behavior change. Behavior change is hard. You can have technology tools for it, okay? but it's hard. And, um, and so you do have... Um, the equivalent of digital therapeutics coming in uh, that give gentle nudges and through that help people manage disease conditions. Um, but it's, it's a tough one. Prevention um, is a tough one because there's human behavior very much involved. It's not so much a technology problem. That's, that's my view, but you may hear other views here. Yes, I think that that's always a tough challenge, nudging behavior, um, working in complex systems uh, to shift uh, uh, choices, individual choices. Uh, we, perhaps, you know, I can bring in an example here from Israel's experience with longitudinal health data. Uh, so uh, the, at the Kalalit Research Institute, they've used longitudinal data uh, over 40 years of uh, patient data, almost uh, cradle to grave data uh, to start predicting um, uh, high risk of renal failure six to seven years in advance which allows you to uh, put in place um, a plan for lifestyle shifts and also uh, raise the level of motivation for compliance with what you know, the doctor's telling you to uh, do. So there, there is this power to answer, answer this question directly. Yes, uh, there is a lot of power in AI, provided you have those kind of data sets and provided you have put them together in a sophisticated, wise way there is this power of prediction. With the power of prediction comes responsibility because the risk of going wrong is very high. 
uh, and therefore I think the benchmarking for these kind of digital health solutions has to be done differently from you know, the kind of diagnostic tools uh, that we've spoken about uh, earlier. But there's another question, very interesting question, which goes into this issue of health costs. I think, um, uh, Andrew, you went into that. Uh, and is how does AI help in reducing uh, rising healthcare uh, costs? Uh, so uh, is there some way of bringing uniformity to clinical costs? I mean, this, something like this would be the holy grail in the US, for example. So what do you think, how can digital and AI help in uh, managing health budgets? Indeed, it, it, it is, it's a provocative question. And uh, I, I threw it in there just to see if we would get questions on that uh, topic. So I think with relation to this behavior uh, element that, uh, that Rahul was just talking about, I think that there, there are trends that occur in the world uh, from in, in service world in general, right? So in uh, say half a century ago, if one was driving an automobile, you would end up going at the petrol station to have uh, people fill, but then they would also check the, the fluids and they'll check the air pressure and the tires and you'll have like a full service uh, experience, right? Now, more and more has shifted to individuals uh, doing all of those things themselves to take care of, uh, of their car. I think that we have a very, very similar path in medicine. In, in, uh, which is unfortunate, I, I, I must say, right? But the expectation of going to a health provider and having a set of, uh, you know, holistic review of everything and ensuring that um, all, all is well has been shifting more and more to, I have a single problem, I need to get this fixed, right? So this is a break fix um, element in, in much of the world, right? So this idea of having preventive or proactive care uh, is going more and more onto the person, right? So uh, you're getting advice, like you should eat well, you should exercise, but these are not, this is not like a prescription. It's simply a statement in, uh, you know, and, and usually from, from somebody that is trusted, but nevertheless, it, it, it falls onto the individual to do this. I think where we will end up seeing this cost curve shift is that these two trends, one where Right now, a lot of cost is in the acute setting and things that require higher acuity of care, right? So hospitalizations and, and ultimately intensive care uh, could shift and be prevented, just as Rahul was saying, if we had more predictive uh, models that, that effectively are seeing uh, where people are. So if, if a person is in the home or in a community and somehow could be uh, touched by a system uh, you know, again, AI on this is necessary because no human would be able to interpret these, these differences. But, but it goes back exactly to this point about context. So understanding uh, what the expected values would be, if you want to talk more in engineering terms, on how it is that uh, an individual should be behaving. And when they deviate from that, then to make an intervention and try to understand what's happening. It's the equivalent, again, going back to this, uh, maybe not great analogy on the car. It's like the check engine light. If it goes on, then perhaps you, you could be seen. So this is like proactive. In that state, I think that we will see that healthcare costs could go down largely on uh, on the end state of reducing the total uh, very high cost of care associated with hospitalizations in, in, in places that, you know, either out of pocket or health systems are, are covering. And, and actually the UK, just as Chris was highlighting, is the place where uh, this is starting to be shown, right, in small places, as, as, I, was, uh, as I was mentioning. So th the key, though, for a lot of this has to do with understanding the boundaries of where is it within the data that you're collecting and, and how is it that you can bleed outside of the health system to ensure that we're, we're able to do this. What is really exciting about the work that you saw from the Wadwani AI Institute is that those, those videos, the anthropometric measurements of these children aren't, though trained in a hospital in Mumbai, uh, have an application that could be used in the home. And, and so you know, suddenly you have the ability to leverage the cadre of workers that are forming this, this very front line who are not, uh, you know, workers and volunteers, right? Who are going into, into communities 
and, and searching, being proactive, right? Uh, in this case, again, looking for low birth weight babies. But in so doing, you, you, it, it begins to, to demonstrate this ability of, of not only having high fidelity data, right? To this point of the, the ASHA log, not showing every child as two and a half kilos, but also of recognizing that the, the, the types of, of efforts that could be done in that setting uh, could be widely expanded. Um, with the addition of, of uh, other objective measurements or other tools uh, that are informed by uh, the data and the AI systems that go on top of it. So it is, again, it's the marriage of the needs of the person, where they would reach out first, and then how is it that we could uh, see this. And, and I'm, I'm quite bullish on uh, you know, AI tools in India tr completely transforming the health system. Uh, because of the existing infrastructure, not just digital infrastructure, but the, the human infrastructure that we, we talked about at the very beginning on how care is uh, provisioned and, and delivered. Fantastic. And that answers, in fact, another question in the chat, how can AI reduce the load of hospital and health workers uh, in the future? Uh, so we, we've really come to the, um, the end of our session. I've been asked to conclude uh, our discussion. It's been great having you on this panel. Uh, Sunil, thank you very much for starting us away off with those inspirational uh, remarks. Uh, and uh, I hand uh, you all back to Abhishek for any final words as our host. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you Amandeep. And it was a very engaging and very well coordinated, well moderated uh, discussion which addressed all the key issues and we are well within time so if there are any last one minute uh, anyone wants to add something before we thank you all formally and conclude the session any last comments sir dr vadwani no i would just encourage everyone uh, listening or watching this program but clearly you're involved you're interested in the in the system you know in the ecosystem around healthcare and data and ai uh, so feel free to reach out to any of us on this panel. Uh, you can get our contact information through the organizers. And I just want to say a huge thank you, not just to everyone else on the panel, but to everyone around the country and that's listening to this program for all the wonderful work that you're doing. I mean, you know, change doesn't happen in a country like ours with small groups of people. Change happens when large numbers of people uh, get really engaged, whether it's from government, as we said, whether it's from the private sector, whether it's the average citizen. So thank you everyone for what you're doing. Please stay involved and anything that any of us on the panel can do to help you in any way, do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Adwani. That was very generous and I'm sure many people will be reaching out to you as we are seeing in the chat boxes that we get the comments of people. Dr. Murthy, any, any last, last comments? You're mute. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, uh, the breadth of uh, points that are covered here was uh, uh, really impressive. Um, from the, uh, I mean, I would like to emphasize on the um, ability of AI uh, was predominantly used. If you look at, uh, uh, you know, last 10, 20 years, the focus was on uh, how can it assist doctors or healthcare practitioners to do better. Um, it can also do a very good job in uh, optimizing the whole workflow and uh, sort of ironing out the wrinkles in the workflow. So I would like to see more and more people applying AI in that uh, space so that we have a really well-oiled machinery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pardi. Any last comments? Oh, th thank you. I, I think uh, I completely agree with Sunil. We all have to be engaged. We all have to be part of it to make this change. So, so thanks for coming and, and please stay engaged because this, this is a unique moment and COVID has you know, lowered the barrier of the, of the healthcare, but also opened up the, you know, in, in tremendous pathways. Uh, we are in 21st century with 21st century tools, but the goal is to, and, 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 and all over the uh, country, we are using you know, 20th century technologies and healthcare systems. So please get involved, everyone. And, and this is the only way to change it. And I'm, uh, I completely agree with Andrew. Uh, I think India can lead it uh, as long as we all are together into this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Andrew, any last comments? 
Uh, only echoing what you've already heard uh, on the call, I, I think this is a really um, dynamic and interesting panel from all of the different perspectives. And, and again, many thanks to the organizers uh, for the opportunity. Amandeep, anything you'd like to add? Last comments before I close? Uh, it was very enjoyable. Thank you, Abhishek, for the opportunity to be on the panel with, uh, with the best in the field and uh, to be even more excited about what is to come, the future of digital health and AI in health. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Amandeep. And uh, thank you, Dr. Vadwani. Thank you, Shiram Murthy ji, Rahul, Andrew, Sanjay, Chris, Indubhushan ji, and Sangeeta Reddy, who had to leave a bit early. But thanks a lot for this very engaging discussion. We, uh, we got very positive response. A lot of people stayed in, tuned in till the very end. The session will be available live on the portal for people to watch later also. And it will also be available on YouTube. And we will take up the Dr. Vadwani's offer of reaching out to him for his advice and suggestions with regard to improving healthcare solutions using AI. So once again, uh, thanks a lot to everyone for joining, uh, making this session, uh, session so engaging. Thank you all once again. And thank you all the viewers for joining in. And we look forward to the next round of four sessions, which are beginning from seven o'clock, seven to nine. We have four parallel sessions. And again, a very exciting set of panelists, experts from across the industry, academia and government will be engaging on various aspects related to AI. So thank you all once again. Thanks a lot.